Hello and welcome again to Cardiac Imaging Agora. Uh, this is uh, a special session uh, this afternoon. I have uh, one of our first year cardiology fellows. Uh, actually, he has a fantastic case to share with us, uh, Dr. Parth uh, Parikh. He's uh, uh, just started his fellowship actually a few months ago. And uh, 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 of course, actually a year and a half ago, right? So yeah. now it's amazing how time passes with this uh, era of Corona. I still think everybody just started last summer. <laughs> where I'm stuck. Um, uh, he has a, actually a case that illustrates some of the uh, uh, novel uh, ways of using cardiac myocardial perfusion imaging, uh, specifically with PET, and managing a very uh, uh, specific population with anomalous coronary arteries. Uh, Parth, can you just tell us about uh, yourself and this case? Yes. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Taper, Dr. Tonelli, for making this wonderful platform which gives us the opportunity to learn about nuclear cardiology and cardiology in general. And I will say that I have used this tool to the maximum possible to learn about nuclear before starting my rotation. So first of all, thank you, Dr. Dave or Dr. Jamali. So uh, I'm Parth, I'm one of the now just recently second year fellows uh, at Cleveland Clinic, and I'm gonna be going over the case so to start off, we have a 60-year-old male who's presenting with exertional chest pain, which results with rest. He feels that the symptoms have been getting worse more so recently. Has past medical history significant for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. So he gets a CTA test done, which, let me go over the images here. Now, kind of pause, go back. And you have the aorta here, the pulmonary artery here. And then as we see here, the left coronary comes out in its regular position, but we see the right coronary artery coming out from the left sinus over here. And then it goes, traverses between the pulmonary artery and the aorta over here as it, with an interarterial course. And then we can't really see the best origin, but it appears like a slit-like origin over here with an acute angle, suggesting some concerning course of the anomalous right coronary artery. So again, this is a beautiful illustration of the elegant application of CT in, this, uh, in the management of chest pain. So we traditionally, you know, we send patients for stress tests. Uh, for uh, imaging with stress tests, but uh, we're evolving in our thinking. Uh, this is a 60-year-old person. He's right at the cutoff where I would be com comfortable with sending them with the CTA because of the worry of uh, calcification, obscuring the coronary uh, anatomy or plaque. Uh, you know, these are patients who usually, uh, you can send them either way. Uh, usually I'm more comfortable with patients under this age group, sending them for CTA without prior history of CAD. But this is again, if we had done a, a general regular stress test on this, we might have caught something, but uh, we, would not, we would not have diagnosed this coronary anatomy uh, abnormality. Yes, absolutely. So this was something that was really helpful to get the heads up on what might be going on. And just a still view over here again, you can see the right coronary artery coming out over here with uh, slit-like opening, acute course, and then going between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And then you do see some calcification in the RCA as well. So just to go over the anomalous origin of the right coronary artery, this was actually a paper that was published uh, out of Cleveland Clinic uh, in 2010, 2011, which I'll be coming back to later in the presentation, where we can see the anomalous right coming out from the left cusp traversing here between the PA and the aorta, which is kind of similar to our case. And this is the image of an anomalous left coming from the right cusp. So in terms of the 2018 guidelines for management of adults with congenital heart disease, there's actually a class one indication of using coronary angio CT or cardiac MRI for evaluation of the anomalous coronary artery and also a class one indication to un have an, an anatomic and physiologic evaluation in such patients. 
So just going over the anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery, for our case, we have a patient with um, the right coronary, which is coming from the left sinus. And then if you have ischemic, ischemic symptoms or ischemia during a diagnostic test, then we would undergo further uh, evaluation for surgery versus just monitoring the course. So again, this is another one here. You can see a class 1C uh, for an anatomic evaluation and physiologic evaluation. They don't give you a specific physiologic evaluation. So uh, well, they kept it vague, not because uh, there was a malicious intent. They kept it vague because there are no data. So in physiologic, uh, you can understand it whichever way you want. You can understand it by regular stress EKG. You can understand it as a stress imaging uh, modality like SPECT or stress echo. You can do a dopamine echo. You can do other things. So they, uh, you can do also invasive evaluation with uh, FFR on these patients. So uh, the physiologic evaluation is, is vague and it opens the door to a lot of uh, uh, confusion what to do next. Uh, but uh, we'll discuss that, I'm sure, later. So coming to the CAT images. So here we just have still images uh, to go off first. So on the right, we can see the left main LAD going this way, the left circumflex coming out here, and then there's some significant stenosis right around here. And then in the left image, it's more of a non-selective angio where we can see a little bit of the anomalous course of the RCA around here. We try and get better images. Unfortunately, it is really difficult to engage the anomalous right. Multiple different types of guys were tried as well. And here again, with the non-selective angio, you can kind of appreciate the cores coming in front of the aorta. And then again, one more view where uh, the interventionalist actually tries to use a wire as well to try and see if we can get into the RCA. This is a better view in terms of seeing how thin and slit-like the origin of the RCA is. Yeah, it's almost to the point where it's, it's almost underdeveloped compared to the other coronary, but probably it's because of the subselective uh, uh, injection. Yes. So this was the final report that severe slip-like anomalous RCA, non-selective angio, demonstrated minimal filling of the proximal portion of the vessel, which is likely the intramural segment, as we talked about in the cell. And obviously, after multiple catheters were used and, and avoid the possibility of an iatrogenic injury to the left main, it was the procedure was finally aborted. And we did know about the severe stenosis of the OM1 as well, which we uh, showed in the first image of the cat. So coming out from here now, in terms of further evaluation and options, as we previously discussed, that it is a 1C uh, indication to have some kind of physiologic uh, evaluation done as well. And that's where this comes across, that this was a paper that was published again out of this institute with Dr. Jaber, Dr. Kramer, and everyone from here about the risk stratification with exercise ammonia PET in adults with anomalous right coronary artery. Uh, the reason behind doing ammonia was that you want to try and exercise them as against having them uh, get regadenosol. Uh, because the issue that we're dealing with over here is more of a mechanical compression as compared to a stenosis in the artery. And it was a retrospective study, small study with 27 patients, all above 18 years, who underwent an exercise ammonia PET to evaluate the anomalous uh, right coronary artery with an interarterial inter and intramural course. Test pain was present in around 90% of the patients. Ischemia was present in 48% of the patients, and they were more likely to have typical angina or exertional dyspnea. 12 patients out of this actually ended up undergoing unroofing surgery, out of which 11 did have ischemic symptoms. And is uh, sorry. Uh, another important thing was that there was no mortality at 245 days in either group of the patients. So part of, this, is, this is something we, we actually came up with uh, a while back, I think over 15 or 17 years ago, 
uh, we were trying to figure out a way to, to do a reasonable stress test on these po in this population that's uh, difficult to manage, where we mimic, as you said, the mechanical compression of the, of the vessel between the uh, uh, aorta and the pulmonary artery. Uh, we're not testing here vasodilatation for atherosclerosis. So we had multiple choices. Uh, one of them was, of course, to do stress echoes on these patients. Uh, one of the problems is uh, because most of the population that comes with this is uh, young, so you get a very rapid heart rate recovery post-exercise, and you might not get peak images of the stress echo, uh, uh, and you might miss, miss the ischemia. The second issue is you can do, of course, a, a stress uh, spect on this population. Uh, the first five or six patients we did were very young. Uh, actually, we did maybe three who were infants, and these were re-implantation of the coronary arteries. And we thought a SPECT image in this population might not be good because first, we don't have the spatial resolution, they have a very small heart. Two, we were concerned about the radiation uh, uh, dose in this population. So we, we tried not to do a SPECT. Besides, you cannot exercise uh, infants. So we had to do something that is uh, uh, related to uh, like increasing the heart rate, increasing the workload and the compression. Now, we thought about uh, uh, rubidium. Uh, the rubidium, of, you, of course, is a, is a very good choice. Unfortunately, you cannot do exercise rubidium because of the very short half of the rubidium. So rubidium with a half-life just over one minute uh, does not allow you to put the patient on a treadmill, inject, and bring the patient back to the camera to do it. So we were left with one last choice, which is uh, PET ammonia. Uh, I know it's limited to ma you know, major institutions because you have to have a cyclotron on site. Uh, on site, and so you can image the patient, you do the rest images, take the patient to the uh, treadmill, uh, do the treadmill test, get maximum heart rate, maximum uh, workload, inject the, uh, the ammonia and rush them back to the camera. Ammonia allows you uh, some time to, not a lot of time, but some time to, uh, to image. So this is how we came up, uh, we came up with this protocol. And uh, so far we've been, we've been very successful with it. However, understanding the limitations of of both the issue of availability of ammonia uh, plus uh, uh, the availability of ammonia, even in centers that have ammonia, because usually the cyclotron is being used for other use, for FDG generation, for other uh, agents at the center. So you can get like a little bit of maybe one or two hours on the cyclotron and you have to be ready and you have to be, the patient has to be here, to resolve scheduling issues. So we moved on and we, we try to do some of these patients right now with, uh, with dobutamine rubidium. And that's probably what you're gonna talk about. Yes, absolutely. So uh, this patient underwent a dobutamine stress uh, cardiac PET where the patient uh, did achieve adequate heart rate response with 142 beats. Uh, it was around 88% of the maximum predicted heart rate with 20 mics of dobutamine. And during that, heart was noted to have around one millimeter downsloping SC depressions in the lateral leads along with frequent PVCs. Uh, did not have any symptoms during the stress component of the test. And then as Dr. Japer mentioned that we then acquire these images uh, and these are the images that we get. Now starting with the stress images, we can see that starting from the apical to the mid base, there's, uh, starting at the apical region, we do see some decreased perfusion in the lateral wall, and then inferior as well when compared to rest images. And as we come towards the mid-basal basal region, we do see a significant defect in the perfusion in the inferior infraseptal and infralateral walls, which go along the side towards, which extend to the base as well. and when comparing it to the rest images, they look pretty much normal with absolute normal perfusion. And you do see these again in the, uh, in the vertical long axis as well, where you can see the inferior uh, perfusion defect significantly when comparing it to the rest. This is very, very impressive uh, ischemia of the RCA. So a couple of, uh, of uh, things here. Uh, as you noted, uh, not only there is the whole RCA literature almost goes down, also it goes down pretty severely. So we have, we don't have a mild defect, we have a very severe defect. Another thing that to notice is this patient uh, from the previous slide that, uh, that you showed did not go to the maximum dose of dobutamine. 
we stopped at uh, 20. Uh, usually the maximum dose is 40 to, uh, to get a diagnostic test, a so-called diagnostic test. But in this instance, I think here we got, we got the information we needed. Uh, he reached a heart rate, but he didn't reach the maximum workload uh, that we would like for with dobutamine. So if you're doing a dobutamine echo, you usually go in 10, 20, 30, 40. Uh, and then if you don't reach the heart rate with 40, you usually can use some atropine. We've had to do that sometimes down here. So, but here again, uh, uh, they showed us the EKG, there was ST depression uh, uh, on the EKG. Patients started having a lot of frequent PVCs with stress. So there was some concern that we're having an issue here. So we, we stopped the test at that level. But again, we got a diagnostic test as far as the intent for it, uh, which is to demonstrate ischemia. Other thing that's very interesting is usually if you start doing the vitamine PET, you will notice a very uh, dramatic decrease in the left ventricular size in normal patients. And in this instance here, we do not have that because what happens with the vitamin PET, unlike, uh, unlike uh, ammonia stress uh, treadmill, you're imaging at peak stress on the, treadmill, on the camera. So the patient is actually on the camera. And if you extrapolate that from the vitamin echo, you will have almost cavity obliteration at peak stress and the cavity will appear very small. So, but in this instance here, you know, of course we didn't reach target heart rate, at, not target heart rate, we didn't reach maximum dose of the vitamin but we still uh, uh, got a diagnostic test and the cavity size did not change from rest to stress. And then just going in terms of the scoring. So we again felt that there was severe ischemia in the RCA territory. And then there was some mild ischemia in the left circumflex territory as well. And then just going over this in a grayscale with the polar maps similar findings. Now, this is interesting in terms of the dyssynchrony. So we can see over here with the rest images that all uh, compartments seem to be contracting together at the same time in a synchronous fashion over here. It's really near to each other. And then with stress, you see how it plays all over the place, which suggests that there was some significant wall motion abnormality as well over here with the inferior and the septal region. This is again, very interesting. So you have a, you can look here at the standard deviation for the synchrony. So most of the segments, as you said, you know, in a, in a qualitative way come together here and uh, relax together. You can have, this is five. The established no number is eight for the standard deviation and the rest images and you can see that doubles. So the ventricle becomes very dyssynchronous and you can see in, in color display on the polar maps, how this uh, inferior wall, inferior septum, uh, all these uh, areas become very dyssynchronous. And now uh, not only we cause ischemia, we call mechanical dyssynchrony of the left ventricle. And again, that also shows the importance that going through all these images in a stepwise fashion is also equally important so that we don't miss something. And again, just looking at the gated images here, we do see that there is significant ball motion abnormality here in the inferior wall uh, and infraceptal with stress as well when compared to the rest images. Which again, again one of the uh, advantages of, uh, of PET over SPECT uh, is we are doing real time imaging at peak stress. So in SPECT, you image the patient at rest, you stress them, you inject them, and then they go around, let's say if with pharmacological stress testing anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes before you do the imaging. So you're not imaging at peak stress really. So it's very hard to see wall motion abnormalities uh, on spec that are stress induced. Uh, sometimes you see them, but you have to have profound ischemia with PET, especially with rubidium PET or dobutamine PET. The patient is right on the camera at peak stress. And you can see here how this inferior wall uh, in the short axis and in the, in the long axis here and the vertical long axis becomes almost akinetic compared to the rest uh, uh, images. Yes. Then just going over the histogram, on the left we have the histogram from the rest images which shows that the heart rate was relatively same at 80 beats per minute. And then over here on the right, we can see the stress histogram. And you can see that again, it's been, it's spread over 120 up to 150. And that in part can, is also because the patient was having frequent PVCs, is my understanding that this, that itself could also cause this widening or multiple uh, 
heart rates that we're seeing here on the histogram. Yeah, this is, this is a step you have to go through in almost in every test to make sure specifically if you see it drop, notice a change in the ejection fraction or something unusual about the ejection fraction in the face of normal perfusion, that usually is an issue of acquisition. So sometimes patients go into AFib, sometimes the machine gets triggered not only by the QRS, but also by the T wave. So you can have double counting. So you have to make sure this is a QA thing for you or QA step to make sure that the EF you're getting is a reliable ejection fraction, especially if you're comparing rest to stress and you're trying to derive a risk profile from that uh, kind of information. Absolutely. And then going over the myocardial blood flow over here. So on the top, we have the stress here, we have the rest, and then with the flow reserves that we see, we usually use the global uh, flow reserve, uh, the flow reserve over here, which shows that the LAD is 1.6, uh, circumflex is 1.61, RCA is significantly low at 0.94, the global reserve of 1.46. Usually we say anything around 1.7, 1.8 is normal. And here we can see that it's significantly low, even if we saw, even for rest, image, uh, rest uh, blood flows, this is significantly low. So even with stress and the global reserve that we're seeing is significantly low, which again goes with all the imaging findings that we have seen so far. This is, this is again, again, one of the advantages of PET over SPECT is you can get this, generate this uh, quantitative flow reserve that's regional and uh, global. Uh, we have a lot of data on the uh, flow reserve with uh, pharmacological stress testing, this is basically with vasodilators like dipyridamol, adenosine, ragadenosine, and that's the mean that you refer to here, the mean flow reserve 1.8, 1.7. Uh, in a normal subject like you know, a young person, uh, this should be way above two. Uh, now, just remember this patient did not reach uh, maximum uh, uh, flow uh, uh, reserve or the capacity because we stopped the test at 20. In addition, this patient was in a very high dose of beta blockers at rest. Uh, so we did not expect him to, uh, to completely vasodilate. But with dobutamine, at least my experience here over the past year since we started doing them, this flow reserve in normal subjects can be all the way up to four or five uh, versus what we see uh, in uh, dipyridamol or with uh, regadenosine. So it depends on the method of, of uh, or the agent you're using for uh, vasodilation or to cause that uh, flow to increase. You have to adjust to that. But in any instance, this is a very abnormal one, even to the point where you can invoke the issue of steel in phenomenon, the RCA, where you're having this uh, steel phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gaber. And then going over the final report, which again is important to make sure that we convey the message for whoever ordered the test is that this was first of all an abnormal test. There was no evidence of any scarred myocardium. As we discussed severe ischemia in the territory of the RCA, mild ischemia in the left circ territory, LV uh, normal size, normal function, same thing with RV normal size, normal function. And then this would be a high risk scan based on the amount of ischemia that we're seeing. In terms of the clinical course, the patient is evaluated by cardiothoracic surgery and is now scheduled to undergo surgical unroofing of the RCA and the cap and the cabbage of the left circumflex artery. Again, so, this is beautiful. This is this is an illustration of you know uh, imaging, guiding, or uh, explaining or uh, justifying what's going on with the anatomy as far as symptoms. So this is correlating it all the way from patient presenting with symptoms all the way to finding actually two processes at the same time, 60-year-old male with atherosclerotic disease in the CERC and a congenital disease in the RCA. Yes, absolutely. So, and just shows the importance of multimodality imaging, stress testing in the appropriate clinical scenario and how that can help us come to a conclusion as to what is the next best step for this patient. And in terms of, just to finish off, that there was a study, again, as I had mentioned, which came out of this center, looking at the long-term outcomes and impact of surgery on adults with coronary arteries originating from the opposite coronary cusp, which showed that uh, patients who had an interarterial course were more, uh, were more likely to undergo surgical intervention, 
and surgically managed patients were significantly more likely to have an abnormal stress test than the medically managed patients, which again is someone who falls within our patient group as well. So I think that's about it. Thank you so much. So this is uh, uh, again uh, an entity that now you you were in a, this is your second month in the stress lab in the nuclear stress lab. I think you're seeing uh, a couple of these a week uh, of patients with anomalous coronary arteries coming here. Uh, one one uh, uh, application that we use this in addition to uh, to RCAs is also also left on the left side. Um, uh, the one thing that we should not be doing this for, for is anomalous circumflex coronary arteries. Anomalous circumflex coronary arteries are in general, uh, almost always, uh, I'm not gonna say 100%, but probably close to 100% benign. Uh, they uh, usually run posteriorly and they don't, uh, they don't get compressed between uh, two coronary arteries. So the other scenario is a left system uh, coming from the right or a, uh, separate uh, origin of DLAD uh, or an intramuscular origin of DLAD. Another recent expansion of this, of this uh, imaging uh, platform with PET is for uh, intramyocardial bridging. We've seen uh, a fair number of patients which hopefully soon will report it uh, with uh, Dr. Gubrael here. Uh, Joanna has had so many patients with uh, uh, intramuscular uh, or my intramyocardial bridging with symptoms. Uh, she's proving ischemia invasively with uh, FFR wires and uh, flow wires, and we're trying to, uh, to establish that non-invasively with dobutamine PET. Stay tuned to what we're going to show there. Parth, thank you for putting, uh, putting on the spot. Uh, we just talked about it this morning, and then here this afternoon, it's already. I uh, appreciate your contribution. I'm glad and thank you for watching Cardiac Imaging Agora. You guys make it special as fellows, and uh, we learn so much from you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chiever.